Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, continuing our verse by verse study through the entire Bible. This is our fourth series in the last 33 plus years. We come today to the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, and we resume our study in verse number one. So get your Bible, open it up to Isaiah 28. We'll begin. In just a minute, a quick reminder that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is another place where you can study the Bible with me verse by verse using my audio Bible messages. The complete series going through the Bible, three series, plus the archives of this fourth, are all there for you at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Study at your pace, at your convenience, any series, any book, any chapter of the Bible, totally up to you. Again, that's all found at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 28, verse 1, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards, of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of those who are overcome with wine. Drunkenness is a sin, as you can tell from verse 1, a sin that God hates, of course. He hates all sin. It's especially serious, I think, when God says woe to someone, as he does here. Jesus said woe to the scribes and Pharisees because they were false teachers, leading people astray, leading people to hell. And here he uses that word again. Drunkenness is a sin that God ha hates. He says, woe to the capital city, which made the drunks there happy. Verse 2, behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, who like a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, like a flood, of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The enemy here refers to the Assyrians, the strong one that God describes here that belongs to him are the Assyrians, wicked people, mean, sinful, cruel, strong, and God would use them to punish his sinful people. Verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trampled under feet. God has the right to use anyone and anything to accomplish his will, to try to bring his people back to their spiritual senses. He can use poisonous snakes. He can use grizzly bears. He can use, he can use lions, he can use the Assyrians, and he will. They will destroy the city that the drunks took such pride in. Verse 4, and the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower, and like the early fruit before the summer, which when that which when he that looketh upon it seeth it, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. Israel's enemy is going to attack them swiftly and totally, just like a person grabs and devours the first ripe piece of fruit of the harvest. Verse 5. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of, of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people and for a spirit of justice 
to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to those who turn the battle to the gate. You know, God injects a message of hope to his people who are going through rough times and will go through even rougher times at the hands of the Assyrians. And he talks about a remnant who will be true to him, who will worship him. When God begins to punish his lukewarm at best people, when he begins to punish those who take his name for themselves, call themselves by his name, when he punishes them because of their sinfulness, only a remnant remains true. The rest will curse him. The rest will die. The rest will be destroyed. But a remnant who snap out of it because of the hard times that they're going through and draw closer to him, they make it through in one spiritual peace and they are God's holy remnant that actually become better in the process. Seven. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. The religious leaders drank too much. And consequently, they did not hear, nor did they understand the word of God. Their relationship with God was cut off. Drunkards are not in fellowship with God. And when you have a leader, a pastor, a preacher, whoever, priest, who is a drunkard, they don't hear the word of God. They don't understand the word of God. And they, they could not teach or lead the people at all. And that's what was going on. And that's why the country was such a basket case. When spiritual leadership, when God's leaders fail, the country will fall to pieces. Society falls to pieces. Verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. What a pathetic example the religious leaders were. The nation was spiritually bankrupt and therefore in a dangerous situation. If they ever needed strong and wise spiritual leaders, it was right now. But the drunkenness of their leaders made them worthless. These people truly were lost sheep without shepherds. No one to guide them in God's ways. No one to guide even the godly remnant that wanted it. And you know, this is, this is what I feel I'm called to. I know there's a lot of lukewarm preachers out there. I know it. Who water down the word of God. I know it. I, that is the vast majority of people who call themselves preachers. And most of the people that sit there and listen to them want it that way or they wouldn't be there and they wouldn't support them. I don't, I don't care about them except to expose their evil. But I do care about the godly remnant who want the straight word of God. Those are the people that I'm interested in blessing. Those are the people along with God, of course, that I want to please. And the things that, that please God are the things that please them because they're godly. And that's the pure word of God, whether it sets well with them or not. Verse 9, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Those who are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. The drunks were saying, who's Isaiah 
trying to teach. Who is this guy? What a throwback. What a strange one. He sounds like he sounds like one of them old timers. Back when our religion wasn't as cool as it is now. Who's he who's he trying to teach anyway? The majority were saying nobody understands what he's saying. Yeah, and I wonder why. Look at verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Isaiah's words sound like nonsense to us, is what they were saying. But notice verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. God says, I'm going to speak to my people with sounds that those drunks cannot understand. And the sound will be the languages of their enemies who do not speak Hebrew. That's the sound, that's the language that's going to be heard in the streets of Israel when their enemies attack and the drunks will not understand what in the world they're saying. And that is a sign of God's wrath on his people. Languages that they do not understand. Verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest by which he may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. God had earlier told his people that they would find peace if they would only repent. But they were not interested. They loved their sin, so they went on their merry way, hell-bound, bound for destruction. They didn't listen, and now judgment is coming, and it will be fast and furious. 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. God says, I'm going to teach my people lesson by lesson, and it's not going to be fun for them. They will stumble and they will fall and their enemies will hurt them and take them away. They would not accept my instructions from my true prophets who preach the pure word of God because they wanted to listen to all the fun things that the false prophets were saying to them, all the pleasant things. They would not listen to the word of God and my warnings. So now they will listen to this lesson that I'm going to bring them. Wrath, judgment, exile, punishment, suffering, and exile. 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Warnings from God. To the foolish, sinful rulers of his people in Israel's south. 15. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood, have we hid ourselves? What happened to Israel north, which was death, destruction, and exile, after years of warning from God's promise, prophets, I should say, what happened to Israel north when they refused to repent should have been a warning to Israel south. But it wasn't. They made the same mistakes. Security based on wishful thinking. 
is what they had. Security based on wishful thinking instead of on a close walk with God is no security at all. I shall never forget a former boss of mine many, many, many years ago when I first started teaching the Word of God. I witnessed to him, witnessed to many people at work about Jesus being the only way to heaven and how they needed to repent. And I remember him saying, well, I don't know, there's so many different religions and I'm just, I'm just, you know, going to hope that everything works out fine. I'm just going to hope that everything works out for the good. Wishful thinking. He found some measure of security in wishful thinking. And I don't know if he ever got saved. That's been, you know, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, and I lost touch with him. But if that's what he went to his grave, if he's still alive, believing he's, he's in hell. It's no, it's no substitute for a close walk with God. But that's what the people of Israel had too. Verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. The cornerstone mentioned here is the cornerstone mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is solid, like a cornerstone, safe and reliable. And anyone who puts their trust in him will be okay. Verse 17, justice also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. Jesus is righteous and holy. So he is the standard to live by. God is saying, if you keep in line with my son, you will be okay. If you follow after lies, you are only kidding yourself. Verse 18. And your covenant with death shall be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trampled down by it. God says that agreement you say you have with death for it not to take you is going to be canceled when I send my judgment your way. 19. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over and day and, and by day and by night and it shall be vexation only to understand the report. In other words, when Assyria attacks, it's going to be a, a total surprise to God's people. 20. For the bed is shorter than a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. Israel South had made an agreement with Egypt for protection, thinking that somehow that would protect them against the wrath of God through Assyria. Regarding that, God quotes a popular saying of that time, if the blanket is too narrow, you cannot wrap it around you. In other words, Egypt is a narrow blanket. It's not going to be able to help you. It falls short. Just telling you ahead of time, you're putting your faith in the wrong thing if you're putting your faith in something other than repentance to save yourself from my wrath everything else falls short 21 for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim he shall be angry as in the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work his strange work 
and bring to pass his act, his strange act. In both of those places, God worked on behalf of his faithful people. But notice verse 22, 22. And by the way, his strange work and his strange act refer to judgment. Verse 22. Now therefore be ye not scoffers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a destruction even determined upon the whole earth. God warns the wicked, you will be destroyed if you do not change your ways. 23. Give ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Listen carefully to God. Listen carefully to the Word of God. We should pay careful attention and try to understand the Word of God because it is the Word of life. Verse 24, Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? A farmer doesn't plow his field over and over again. He plows it, and that's it. And then he goes on to step two. He doesn't keep plowing. Notice 25, When he hath made plain the face of it, Doth he not cast abroad the dill, and scatter the cumin, and cast in the wheat in rows, and the appointed barley, and the spelt in their place? When the soil is prepared, the farmer does not plow again, and then plow again, and then plow again. When the soil is prepared, the farmer plants his seed. Notice verse 26. For his... God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him. God teaches farmers to plow and then plant. Where do you think they got that understanding from? You say, well, it's pretty basic. Yeah, where do you think they got that from? Man doesn't have the ability to even think of that by themselves. God teaches farmers to plow and then plant. If there wasn't a God, then man would, wouldn't even be here, let alone be here and be able to reason. Reasoning and wisdom is a gift from God. 27. For the dill is not threshed with the threshing instrument, neither with, ne with the threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned, upon, turned about upon the cumin, but the dill is beaten out with a staff, and the cumin with a rod. So a farmer knows the correct way to harvest his crops, which is described here. This is also a gift from God. See, wisdom for even these sorts of earthly things come from God. That's how dependent we are on God. That's why when people turn away from God and flat out reject him, and flat out reject the word of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not fitting. And that's why you have people come, trying to come up with solutions to problems apart from God and apart from the word of God. And they just make matters worse. Because they have no ability to reason apart from God. And you're going to turn away from God and give him the cold shoulder. You're on your own, buddy. And you're going to make a mess of things. And when you try to correct it, you're going to make a more mess. And that's just the way it always is. And that's the way it is today. 28. Bread, grain is ground because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor grind it with his horsemen. So farmers back in those days would drive their cart and horses over the stalks of grain to knock the grain out. The farmer would not continue to drive over the stalks until the grain was crushed to powder. Again, discretion is a gift from God. Verse 29, This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in workings. God is smart. He's the one who teaches man to do his job successfully. God is very capable. He can teach us 
he can he can teach us then he and, and he does he's he's the one who gives us all this wisdom and ability to do these mundane earthly things that are so needful for survival in this world and if he can teach us then he certainly knows how to achieve his purposes for us if he can teach us how to get things done then he knows what to use in our lives what to allow in our lives to get things done to fulfill his plan and purpose for us he knows what he's doing that's why you might as well just trust in his word that's your best bet always even if you don't understand it out of time continue studying with me at the bible verse by verse dot com remember you can study the whole word verse by verse three complete series along with this fourth one verse by verse using my audio bible messages at the bible verse by verse dot com remember also that i'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination this has been a faith ministry for 33 years i depend completely and totally on your prayers and financial support so pray for me pray for the word click the donate button at the top of the front page at the bible verse by verse dot com and prayerfully give as the lord may lead until next time michael moret for scripture verse by verse so long everyone